Can you guess the origins of these words? Let's try it together with this quiz from HowStuffWorks.com. Language is not controlled by dictionaries and grammarians, though students of language are often made to feel that way. Instead, dictionaries and grammarians track the logic that holds a language together and the many meanings that words accrue as they pass through time. Very true. In other words, the speakers of a language create the language. The study of the origin of words, known as etymology, attempts to follow how words come into being and how the friction of historical events shapes their meaning. For instance, Old English, the oldest ancestor to our modern English, came into being when Germanic tribes migrated to Britain in around 5 AD. The clashing of cultures created a need for unique language. Another clash, the Norman Conquest in 1066, drastically shaped the language to such a great extent that it ushered in the next era of English, Middle English. With the Norman invasion, Latin and French influences entered the spoken and written language. The Renaissance fascination with ancient languages like Greek and Latin marked the beginning of the shift to modern English. The words we use are still changing, of course, with hundreds being added to the dictionary each year and sanctioned as accepted English. In 2019, Merriam-Webster added screen time and unplug among 638 others. Holy cow, really 638 words just in 2019 were added? Yowza. As these words show, the changing language reflects the dramatically shifting cultural landscape. Take this quiz and test your knowledge of the shifting sands that formed these words. All right, let's try it together. I'm going to click start quiz. Okay, number one, which ancient war tradition earned the name berserk? Which ancient war tradition? Uh, Norse warriors dressing in bearskin coats and ferociously attacking the enemy. Berserk. Scottish warriors flashing their kilts at the opposing side. Berserk. Uh, Vikings who would bare their chests in the dead of winter to show lack of fear. Or women who would get stir crazy while the men were at war. I don't think it's that one. I don't know about the Vikings. Norse warriors dressing in bearskin. I'm leaning toward the bearskin or the flashing kilt. So does it sound Norse or Scottish? Oh, man, what are some Scottish words? Haggis. Uh, I'm going to go with Norse dressing in bearskin. Hey, correct. The act of going berserk where a person runs around in a frenzy uh, wrecking their surroundings hails back to the ancient Norse warriors who were said to dress like a bear. Bjorn and Sirk coat. Okay, so Bjorn means bear and Sirk means coat. Bear Sirk, bear coat. That's pretty cool. Uh, these warriors channeled the power of the bear to attack the enemy ferociously. Ah, so I got the first one right. How did you do? Next word is jumbo. How did the word jumbo come to mean something unusually large? That's easy. It's the opposite of wumbo. Uh, let's see. Uh, it refers back to a jumbo jet. I can't imagine that was the first usage. Uh, it originally was the name of a very large rock in Australia. Crikey, that's Jumbo. Mount Jumbo. Maybe. Uh, jumbo was the name of the London Zoo's huge elephant. No, they're just playing on Dumbo, I think. Jumbo, the elephant in it. Uh, Jumbo specified a breed of cow known for being unusually large. I'm thinking it's the Australian rock or the large breed of cow. Jumbo the cow, Jumbo the rock. It does sound like Australian slang to me for some reason. I'm going to go with Australia. Wrong! Oh, it really was London's zoo, the huge elephant at the London Zoo. Was Dumbo based on Jumbo? Let's see. Uh, in 1882, the word Jumbo began to be used generally to refer to something unusually large. The reference was pointed back to the London Zoo's enormous elephant Jumbo. 
Scholars speculate that this name may have originated from a West African dialect where Jumbo meant elephant. Okay. So it might just mean elephant originally. If you've been placed on quarantine, where can you trace the origins of your predicament to? Okay, where do we get the word quarantine? I think it's related to the word quone. Let's see, in the Middle Ages, the sick were placed in jail or quora. Is it jail? Maybe. In ancient Rome, lepers were sent at least 40 feet or a quorum away from the town. Quorum. Hmm. In ancient Greece, those infected with diseases had to do penance, a quarant, to appease the gods. Quarant. Quarant. During the plague, ships were held in port for 40, or quaranta, days to slow the spread of disease. Hmm. Quaranta. That does sound like it could be a Latin... 40, uh, 40 days, Black Plague, <sighs> that's a tough one, I'm gonna go with the Black Plague 40 day ship rule thing, and that's correct, I got it, got another one, okay, back on track, comeback train, here we go, uh, let's see, the Black Plague, or the Black Death, wiped out nearly 25 million people, almost a third of the European continent's population. To try to stop the spread of disease, passengers aboard ships in Italian ports would be detained for 40, or quaranta, days before being allowed on the shore. All right, I got another one. How are you doing so far? Next question is if you hazard a guess, which language family are you tapping into? All right, the word is hazard, and we just have language families as the option this time. Arabic, Latin, Greek, or Germanic. You know, off the top of my head, I'm thinking Germanic. Uh, yeah, I really don't think it's Latin. I doubt it's Greek, and it's not coming across as very Arabic. I don't know, hazard. Hazard just sounds like a strong Germanic word. I'm going with Germanic. Ah, oh, it was Arabic. All right, let's see what they have to say. The word hazard comes to English through the Arabic language family via the Spanish word azar for an unfortunate card or throw at dice. So the Arabic influence on the Spanish word reveals the profound mixing of Spanish and Arabic culture in the Middle Ages that we now use the word for taking a chance shows the use of metaphor in language building. Interesting. Okay, uh, I think I'm at two right and two wrong so far, so not doing great. Let's see what we have next. When you are wandering in a haze, what language meaning is connected to your situation? Is this just about the definition of the word? Because it says haze, a sense of confusion, a sense of irony, a sense of rage, and a sense of ecstasy. It's got to be confusion, right? Or am I confused? Because right now, wandering in a haze means confused, like you're wandering through the fog, right? You can't see, so you're not sure, you're confused. It's got to be a sense of confusion. I feel like it might be a trick question, though. Okay, I'm right. The word haze does not date back much earlier than the 18th century in England. A relatively new word. Where the word originally referred to a state of confusion and vagueness. It was then used to refer to an opaque environment like the fog. Tellingly, the English language is the only language to have three words. Haze, mist, and fog. Uh, that differentiate levels of opacity. Okay, haze, mist, and fog are different levels of opacity. Hmm. So haze is the least, or the most opaque? No. Haze is clearer and then mist, and then fog is the hardest to see through? I don't know, that's not part of the quiz, I'm thinking too much. Next one is, what origin does the word disaster point to? What 
origin does the word disaster point to? Hmm. The Greek belief in a bad alignment of stars, disaster, disaster, maybe. Uh, the Latin understanding of a disturbance in gravitational forces. I don't know about that one. Uh, the Italian name for a poisonous plant or the Roman practice of separating families. Disaster, disaster, disaster. Oh, this is a disaster. I think of like natural disasters. That's what's coming to mind. Maybe it's because they have this picture of a flood and the family sitting on the roof. I'm going to go with the Greek belief in a bad alignment of stars. Yes, got it. Uh, the word disaster, which we now generally apply to stressful, unfortunate events, originates from the Italian word disastro, which literally means ill star. Hmm, a disastro. The word came from the Greek understanding that a bad alignment of stars and planets contributed to catastrophic events. Hmm, interesting talk about the fault in our stars am i right all right four right two wrong so far that's not bad i'm feeling better let's see what we have next if someone is fluent in a language what meaning does this attribution tap into uh flowing easily like a river fluent fluent fluid filling up like a glass fluent a sense of pride, fluent, or a sense of hard work, fluent. I don't know, I'm liking that first option, fluent, flowing easily like a river. Maybe that's just because it sounds like fluid and they're throwing me off, but I don't care. None of the other ones sound right. I'm going to go with river. Ah, it's correct. Wow. Okay, a speaker who is fluent in a language shares the original meaning of flowing freely like a river, uh, which the original Latin word contained. This sense of fluid and river adds texture and imagery to the concept of fluency, that, that language speakers can adapt and flow without effort in communication. That's beautiful. I actually really like this one because I've always been confused about the word fluent and fluency. Uh, I know in teaching English and like linguistics in general, uh, people don't really use the word fluent. It's not something that you can really measure with accuracy. You know, we talk about proficiency in schools. You put people at different levels, but how do you know when someone's fluent? in a language. Well, who knows? I mean, it's as mysterious as the flow of a river. Which mythical story does the word clue owe its modern meaning to? Prometheus and fire, Narcissus and echo, Narcissus? Narcissus? Odysseus and the Cyclops, or Theseus and the Minotaur? Oh, man, I really have no idea. I mean, clue, clue, like a hint, like something that helps you solve a mystery. I don't think it's Narcissus and Echo. That doesn't seem to relate to that story of the, you know, looking at your own reflection type of thing. I don't know about Odysseus and the Cyclops. I don't know where a clue would... Well, maybe. I'm going to go with Prometheus, Prometheus and fire, because I feel like Prometheus helped humans solve the mystery of, you know, harnessing fire. I don't know. So there could be like a clue in that story somehow. I don't know. I'm going with Prometheus. And that's wrong. It's Theseus and the Minotaur. All right. Clue used to mean a ball of yarn. The sense of the word shifted to mean anything giving an indication or direction in a complex situation, thanks to the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. Okay, but why? Uh, in the myth, Ariadne, Ar Ariadne, Ar I don't know, uh, this person gives Theseus a ball of yarn 
when he is sent into the labyrinth where the Minotaur dwells. He unwinds the yarn as he goes and is able to follow the clue to get out. Ah, so it's literally a clue, a ball of yarn, and he follows it on the way out, like the breadcrumbs and the the kids with the witch or whatever that one is. Anyways, <clears throat> got that one wrong. Next one is, what is the original meaning of woman? Oh, I feel like I've heard this one before. Uh, woman, let's see, companion female human being, part man, and sister. I'm pretty sure this is, I think it's from Old English for female human being. I think man meant human being. Oh, no, no, no. Man means human. And then it was like, where man meant male human. And then woman meant female human. Because, like, werewolf is, like, man-wolf. Let's see if I'm right. Female human being is my guess. Yes! In Old English, the word woman originally came from the compound of whiff. Okay, whiff meant woman, and man meant human being. Oddly, the language joined together a word which already meant a female human to the masculine word for a human being. Wait, what? The language joined together a word which already meant... A female human to the masculine word for human being. Okay, so man was a masculine word for human, and then if whiff already meant woman, but we didn't have the word woman, but it became female, female human plus masculine human. Man, the English language does not make sense. All right, I'm just gonna move on to the next one. Uh, in which language does the name mermaid have its roots? Old English, after the last one, that sounds right. Arabic, Old French, or Latin, mermaid. Oh man, after that, that last one about the whiff man, mermaid sounds like it could be Old English too. Old French, mermaid, mermaid. I'm going to go with Old English. Yeah, uh, fuck it. I'm going to go with Old English. And it's correct. Wow. Okay, the word mermaid has ancestors in Old English. Mere whiff. We know whiff means woman now. Uh, which meant water witch. <laughs> okay, so whiff means woman and witch. Cool. Good job, Old English. Uh, in Middle English, mermaid took on maid, which meant single woman. Uh, early legends of mermaids have negative connotations, where mermaids usually end up harming those they encounter. Yeah, the classic siren. They lure you in with the siren song and then eat you alive under the ocean or something like that. Okay, that one's crazy, so it's definitely Old English. All right, moving on. What else do we have? When someone is buried, what other meanings go in the ground with them okay buried what we're looking for buried uh stone foundation lost or confused shelter or protection or doorway oh my god i have no idea i have no idea on this one when someone is buried stone foundation lost or confused Shelter or protection. You know what? I'm going to go with shelter or protection because I'm thinking like it's saying when somebody is buried and, and someone, when you bury someone, it's because, you know, they passed away and you want to honor them, uh, maybe protect them, shelter them from, I don't know, the, the earth or something more spiritual about the afterlife. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna go with shelter or protection. And it's correct. Wow, okay. And it looks like it's Old English again. Old English strikes again. The Old English word that eventually became Barry was Bairgan. Bairgan. Uh, which meant to enclose in a grave or tomb. This word was related to the Proto-Germanic word Bjorgan, to shelter or protect. The ancient word contains the meaning of sheltering the dead from the elements. Sheltering the dead from the elements. That's exactly what I was trying to say. 
Damn, my intuition is good. Uh, next one is, what meaning does the modern use of the word amateur derive from? Amateur, amateur. Lover? Naivete? Likeness? Frame? Uh, I mean, I feel like it's not frame. Likeness doesn't sound right to me. It's, I mean, naivete sounds right. Naivety, naivete. But for some reason, lover, lover is sticking out to me. Like, uh, it's got ama, amour, sounds vaguely French, the language of love, hello. Of course, naivete has got to be French too, right? Hmm. I don't know, naivete, lover, what should I do? I'm clicking lover, I'm gonna click lover. Yes. Oh. All right, amateur, a word that signals someone who is interested in an art form but is not a practitioner, comes from the Latin amateur for lover or friend. Interestingly, the word which originally showed love for something now connotes a lack of expertise. Uh, I mean, that makes sense as an origin, someone that's interested in an art form but is not a practitioner. It's like you love something, but you haven't really practiced it or you're not an expert. So I could see how that would that would turn into that. All right, kind of surprised I got that one. What's next? Which of the following meanings is related to the origins of the word heresy? Heresy, okay, which meaning? Hair, <laughs> no, hair, heresy, I don't think so. Sin, I mean, that seems obvious. Decline or choice? Is it too obvious that it's sin? Like, it's got to be sin, right? Uh, heresy? <clears throat> what exactly is heresy, though? I feel like it could be choice. Now nah, I'm going to go with sin. Just got to trust my gut. Oh, my God, it is choice. No. It was too easy. It was a trick. They tricked me. Okay, so heresy generally describes a view that departs from the accepted norms, usually of religious doctrines. The word came from the Greek word heresies, which meant choosing for yourself. Taking your own choice and departing from the norms is later seen as problematic in dogmatic settings. Okay, I should have known... Very traditional religions don't like it when you make your own choices. That is what heresy is. Okay, all right, all right, let's try it, everyone. If someone told you you were a nice person in the 13th century, what would they be saying about you? Hmm, what did nice mean in the 13th century? The 12 hundos that you were kind? Too obvious, it had to have changed since the 13th century. That you were attractive, maybe. Hey, looking nice. That you were foolish, maybe. Or that you were brilliant. Hmm. I feel like the first two are too obvious, like sin was. So it's got to be foolish or brilliant. I'm going to go with foolish because ignorance is bliss. So if you are ignorant... You might be more blissful and therefore more kind. So I could see how ignorance or being foolish would lead to being kind, which is what we think of as nice today. So it's got to be foolish, right? Nice equals foolish. Let's go. Yes. Oh my gosh. Back on track. Come back, Jane. The word nice has morphed dramatically since the Middle Ages. In modern English, the word most nearly means kind. Like I said, but in the 13th century, it carried the meaning of foolish or ignorant. Wow, they even say ignorant. Ignorance is bliss. Uh, the term became more ambiguous before making a shift toward the positive. Nailed that one. All right, what's next? Which elements make up the word innocent? Not nocent? Let's see. <laughs> yeah, that's the first option. In, not, and then nocent, harm. Not, not harm. Uh, second option, in, inside, nocent, pure. Uh, I feel like nocent might be pure. Like, uh, like birth, like nacer in Espanol. 
Uh, let's see, in, inside, no since birth. Oh my god, that's the next option. Okay, that, maybe it's that one. But inside birth? How does that mean innocent? Uh, and finally, in, without, and no since sin. Okay, without sin makes sense. Maybe no sin could be related to birth, but it's talking about original sin, which I believe is when you are you are born, you're already a sinner because of Eve. Thanks a lot, Eve. You know, uh, Eve in the Garden of Eden bit the apple when she wasn't supposed to. That's the original sin, and then everyone else is born with the original sin from birth. But if you are innocent, innocent, you are without sin, without your uh, born sin, without original sin. Yeah, I'm going with the last choice. Yeah. Damn, I really convinced myself with that explanation, but I was wrong. Okay, it was not harm. Innocent, which usually means the state of being without guilt, is composed of the prefix in not and the root nocent from nocentum nocentum harm so the original word has more to do with a state of not having done harm rather than being guilt-free in any legal sense all right if an old english speaker said they were giddy about pumpkin spice season how would people generally understand them? Okay, what does giddy mean in Old English? Uh, the season gave them a feeling of elation. The spice was like a natural dopamine. The ever-present spice made them feel insane. Or smelling the spice all the time led to an intense hunger. So does giddy mean hungry? Does it mean crazy? I feel like it's one of the first two, elation or dopamine. Elation sounds too much like the modern meaning, so I'm going to go with the dopamine one. It's like giddy means you're drugged up, and that leads to the elation. No. Oh, man, I'm not doing so good anymore. It's the insane one. Well, today the word giddy connotates happiness to the point of being disoriented. It originally focused heavily on the disorientation meaning insane, mad, or stupid. It could even be related to the state of being possessed. Wow. Since the 16th century, though, the meaning of happy elation has attached to the word. What connotation did the word hope originally contain? Theological, biological, mythical, or magical? I mean, what's the difference between mythical and magical? <laughs> and, and theological? Theological is similar to mythical, right? I mean... Theological seems too obvious. I'm going to go with the least obvious sounding one, which is biological. Oh, it's theological. I'm thinking too much. So even in Old English, the word hope has been filled with theological connotation, meaning a sense of confidence in the path of salvation. Only much later, around the 13th century, did the broader application of hope as a wish for something come into use. All right, all right. Which object is associated with the origin of the word ostracize? And they have a picture of some ostriches. Uh, ostrich egg, pottery shard, stone or paper? Ostracize. It's got to be pottery shard because it's like broken off from the main thing. And when you're ostracized, you're like, you know, pushed away, outcast from the group. I can imagine a shard breaking off of pottery being like, you know, broken off, banished from the original form of the thing. Yeah, I'm going with pottery shard. Aha, okay, I got one. In ancient Greece, the population used to vote on whether a person should be banished from the community by casting a vote on a piece of broken pottery called an ostracon, ostracon. If the community agreed that the person should be cast out, the person was then ostracized. Okay, uh, the reason I thought this was correct was wrong. So I got lucky that it was pottery shard. So they would vote by writing on a piece of pottery? Did they not have paper? <laughs> or like some cloth, something? Like even a rock? Uh, I mean, I guess that's recycling. You know, if you have some broken pottery lying around, might as well... 
vote with it. These days we look for loopholes as ways to get out of the full extent of the law. What were they originally used for? What were loopholes used for? Probably something on a boat? Let's see what the options are. Protection for archers. Uh, tying rope through. That sounds right. Fastening the gate of the fort. Could be that. Or a window for prisoners. Okay, I don't know what this picture is supposed to be telling me, but I feel like it's there to throw me off. Loopholes. Loopholes. I'm going to go with tying rope through it. Tie rope through the... No? Protection for archers. That wasn't even my second guess. Uh, loopholes now provide ways to avoid paying full taxes. But back in the 13th century, they gave protection to archers who could shoot through the small hole in the fortress, leaving little opportunity for the enemy to shoot back. Okay, that makes sense. A lot of these are from the 13th century, it seems like. What was going on then? Which aspect of the weather is the original word most closely connected to? Which aspect of the weather? Uh, heat, cold, wind, or rain? Weather. Weather, weather, weather. We say under the weather when we're sick. That makes me think like rain, under the rain. It has a picture of an umbrella, <laughs> but uh, that could be there to throw me off. Fuck it, I'm gonna go with rain. Wind, oh, I was thinking it. I thought it for a second. Uh, the word weather has, from its Old English roots, described the air, sky, breeze, or storm, but its Proto-Germanic root, wedra, means wind. It refers to wind. Uh, this makes sense as the wind does bring in the changes in weather that humans experience. Okay. Okay, I should have thought about that one a little bit more. Which early sense adhered to the earliest root of the word holy? Sacred, plentiful, shining, or healthy? It can't be sacred. That's too easy. Uh, plentiful? Plentiful, shining, healthy. I'm going with shining. You know what? I'm just going to say shining. No, it's healthy? Oh my goodness. Since Christianity has had an influence on the language, even in Old English, the word holy has meant sacred or consecrated, set apart, yeah. Before Christianity left this imprint on the language, though, the term had more to do with health or wholeness, something which should be left intact. Oh, holy like wholeness? Holy, uh, healthy, all right, all right, I get it, I get it. What original meaning did the word common have? Common, peasant, the plaza, held together, or neighbor? I'm thinking it's peasant or plaza, because plaza could be the, you know, the center of town. It's like the common area where, like, you know, just people can come and hang out, everyone can gather but that's why I feel like it also might be peasant, because that's like the common man, the common person. Uh, you know, not the king, not even any level of nobility, no level in the church, just common person, peasant. And the plaza might not even have been a place where peasants could go, at least not up on a stage. So I'm leaning toward peasant. Should I do it? Should I do it? Yeah, I'm gonna click peasant. No, it's not peasant and it wasn't plaza either. It's held together. Uh, common, which now can mean either something plain or something belonging to all or a group, comes from the Latin roots comoini, meaning held together. The sense of plain came in the 14th century and seems connected to the idea of just being one among many, held together. Hmm. Which of the following meanings adhered to war in its original use? Confuse, kill, harm, starve. Kill and harm seem too obvious, although that doesn't mean that it can't be those ones. War. Hmm, what is it good for? I really don't know on this one. Uh, starve? I'm just going to click starve. Confuse. All right. 
I'm confused. The Old English where had the same meaning of large-scale military conflict that we associate with war today. Its Germanic ancestor, though, veran, meant to confuse or perplex, defining war by its effects rather than its actions. What does the root word for lunatic show about early beliefs in the origins of insanity? Probably not something good. Let's see. It was caused by diseases spread by ticks. Lunatic. <laughs> I don't know about that. It was caused by the moon. La luna. Okay. It was a result of hearing the call of the loon. Loony. The loony bin. Maybe. It was the result of eclipses. Another moon-related thing. Kind of like the hearing the call of the loon one. To also make the connection to Looney, Looney Tunes, Looney Ben, you know what I mean? I'm going to go with the Call of the Loon. Oh, it's the moon one. Ah, oh. So it is the modern word lunatic, which refers to an insane person, derives from the Latin lunaticus, meaning moonstruck. This word had connotations of insanity from its earliest origins and shows the early belief in an association between madness and moon phases. This connection also exists in Germanic and Greek languages. Lunaticus. That's cool. That's a cool Latin word. If you didn't know, uh, our cat's name is Luna. This is Luna. Meet Luna. If she were alive in the Latin-speaking times, we would have named her Lunaticus. You are now Lunaticus the Great. Oh, she doesn't like that. Which of these meanings predates the modern meaning of the word quick? Uh, and we have a cute little picture of a dog running. Okay, quick. Upright, light, honest, or alive? My gut told me right away that it's alive. And I'm just going to go with it without thinking. It means alive. Wow, I should trust my gut more. It does mean alive. Uh, in Old English, if you were quick, C-W-I-C, it wasn't really a compliment. Just a statement that your heart was beating. Okay. The modern meaning, though, has been associated with the word since the 12th century, when it took on the meaning of rapid, uh, from the connection with being full of life. Alive, full of life. You know, in my head I was thinking, like, the quickening of the heart means, like, it's going faster or something like that. So it literally just means your heart is beating, was the original meaning. Alive. All right. Cool, I finally got another one. Which meal did the word dinner originally refer to? Uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, last meal of the day, or second breakfast? Uh, dinner, dinner, dinner. I'm thinking it might be breakfast because of like the D-I in there it makes me think of all these uh, words I think are that are of Latin origin that have you know, D in there and the I, like dia in Espanol, diurnal, it's like daily. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, breakfast. That's correct. The word dinner, which some English speakers use to describe the final meal of the day. Some English speakers? Oh, because of supper? Anyways, uh, some English speakers use to describe the final meal of the day and others use for the midday meal? Wait, really? Do people in England say breakfast, dinner, supper? Like dinner is in the middle of the day? If someone that calls lunch dinner, let me know in the comments uh, what's going on over there, wherever you are. It's related to the Latin... Oh my goodness, disjejunare. There's no way I pronounced that right, disjejunare. Uh, to break a fast or breakfast. So by the 13th century, it was used to describe the main meal of the day. Interesting. Who did the derogatory name dunce first apply to? The court jester Dunk, the reviled Don of Spain, followers of Duns Scotus, or a family in Italy known for their ignorance? Uh, Duns. Doesn't sound like it would be Italian to me. I feel like the court jester one makes a lot of sense. And I don't know, like the Dunce hat 
seems like sort of a medieval costume type of thing that we carried forward as a tradition. So I'm going to go with the court jester. No, followers of Duns Scotus? What does that even mean? The derogatory appellation dunce has been used since the Renaissance to put down a person's ability to think clearly. Originally, though, the meaning had a very specific target. Followers of the philosopher Duns Scotus, whose ideas had fallen out of popularity. This was a guy's name, Duns Scotus? Duns Scotus? All right, that was a weird one. If you were in the favor of the king in the Middle Ages, what was the likely cause? Your intelligence? Probably not. Your attractiveness, that sounds like something kings would look for. Your wealth, I mean, that seems obvious. Or your aptitude for battle. Okay, actually, all of these <laughs> would make sense, I feel like. Yeah, none of these sound ridiculous. So there's not even a word here that's in quotes. It just says, if you were in the favor of the king. Couldn't the king favor you for any of these reasons? Oh, man. Uh, Middle Ages, there was a lot of war going on. I'm gonna go with the aptitude for battle. Let's see what they have to say. No, your attractiveness. Favor. Okay, I think favor was supposed to be in quotes. Favor. Favor, a root of the word favorite, came to mean approval or praise by the 15th century. In the 13th century, though, the earlier use of the word referred to beauty or attraction. This draws a clear connection with the sources of praise and approval. Okay, I didn't know favor was the particular word I was looking for. So I think that's a typo in this quiz, uh, how stuff works. Put some quotes around favor on this question, all right? Not that I would have gotten it right with those quotes there, but which language family does the word horse originate from? Horse, Germanic, Latin, Greek, West African. Germanic, Latin, Greek, West African, horse. I feel like it's not Latin. Uh, it could be Greek, I don't know. I really don't know. I just don't think that it's Latin, so I'm going to be mad if it is. Let's just go with West African. There's, there's animals in Africa. Germanic. Okay, so horse remains essentially unchanged from the Old English. The Germanic word horse. Some scholars believe the word to come from the Proto-Indo-European root curs for run. Horses do run, but this is not a certainty. Which emotional reaction is at the root of the word horror? Fear? Seems obvious. Fear, grief, disgust, or shame? Okay, okay. It could be disgust. I mean, it could be grief or shame. Who really knows? I'm thinking disgust. I'm just gonna... Yeah, I'm gonna go with disgust. Some horror movies are disgusting. Yes, it is disgust. Awesome. Surprisingly, though the modern inflection of horror has to do with intense fear, the earliest meaning in the 14th century describes a feeling of disgust. From that feeling of shrinking back, the word morphed to mean the experience of dread. Fear elicited by horror has disgust at its root. Huh. Next question. If a person had a sense of elation, in the earliest sense of the word, how would they be perceived? Okay, elation is the word. As someone with overactive self-esteem, as someone with intense joy, that's what we think of it as today, as someone high on a mountain, elevation? As someone lost in their thoughts, the mountains or the thoughts seem good to me. Hmm. I'm gonna go with the mountain, high on the mountain. Oh, this is probably my last guess. Uh, someone with overactive self-esteem? The word elation, which is commonly used to describe an experience of high spirits, originally referred to someone with a heightened sense of themselves. The sense of arrogance shifted in the 18th century to mean lifted spirits. All right. What action is the verb hallucinate related to in its original sense, hallucinate, to wander in the mind, to slip into insanity, to get lost, or to lose vision. To lose vision, not to have a vision. Hallucinate, hallucinate. Hmm, I'm not seeing any clear root words in here. 
I'm actually gonna go with to lose vision. No, to wander in the mind. The verb hallucinate, which now means to experience something in the senses that is not actually there, derives from the Latin word hallucinare, to wander about in the mind or to dream. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, it's the original trip, in other words. All right. Which unlikely object was referred to by the plural of ineffable? Wait, what? I mean, right now, ineffable is an adjective in English, and we don't have plural adjectives. So either ineffable was a noun, or, you know, some languages have plural adjectives, so that, that's not really telling me much. What are the options? Dishes, bras, trousers, or socks? Ineffable. Wow, I have no idea. Ineffable? You know, bras are pretty ineffable for some people. I'm gonna go with bras. No, trousers. Trousers. Uh, Trousers means pants for all my American viewers out there. The adjective ineffable describes that which cannot be described. In the original Latin, it means not utterable. Somehow in the early 19th century, the word ineffables came to be used to describe trousers. Wait, so it meant not utterable first and then it meant trousers? Wait, does trousers mean underwear? Okay, again, someone from England or you know, whatever UK English speakers who say trousers, let me know in the comments, please. Are trousers pants or, or underpants? Not utterables? My, my ineffables? I don't know about that one. Before epic described a period of time, what did it mean? Um, a day, something held in place, a journey, or something to be determined. I don't think it's a journey because that's that's closer to the meaning of epic, E-P-I-C, like an, an epic tale. A day? I would wonder how the meaning would stretch from one day to like a long period of time, but that's possible. I kind of like the last option, something to be determined, because usually an epic is how you define a long period of time after it's already happened. So it's like determining something in the past as an epic. Yeah, I'm gonna go with something to be determined. No, something held in place. All right, epic has meant a fixed point in time since its Greek origins. That original word comes from the Proto-Indo-European word epi, on and icon, hold or something held in place. The meaning of a period of time came about in the 17th century. Very interesting. Hmm. In the earliest use of the word, if you hit your curfew, what would you have to do if you hit your curfew? Put out the fire, get home quickly, make up a story about where you've been, or hide your friends? I don't think it's get home quickly. It might be. Uh, I'm, I don't think it's make up a story about where you've been. My gut's not telling me anything, and my brain's not telling me anything either, so I need to just throw a guess out there. I'm actually going to do put out the fire. I could see how that could morph into, like, you know, turn out the lights, it's bedtime, curfew. Yeah! Oh, that's it. Wow, okay, I guess my brain is still working. In the 14th century, the word curfew referred to a signal that told everyone to put out their lights and fires. Yeah. It literally meant cover fire, curfew, okay. Lights out. The modern use of the word as a name for putting limits on where someone can be at certain hours dates back to the 19th century. Okay, that was the last one, and my score is 15 out of 35. And it even says, better luck next time. Wow, that's not a good score, 15 out of 35. Oh man. That's really bad. That was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Did you do better than me? How did you do on this quiz? Whatever score we got on this quiz, I feel like I learned something while reading through about the etymologies of these words. Uh, I hope you learned something too. I hope you had some fun. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoy the next book that you read. Maybe you'll discover some new words in there. All right, bye.